This is the second tutorial in my series on setting up sensory percussion to do your own thing. We're starting out by covering a lot of ground with controllers. This video is focusing on different ways to utilize velocity controllers. This is by no means exhaustive, but it's intended to be a springboard for your own ideas to utilize velocity in sensory percussion. We'll be throwing in timbre controllers too, so if you're unfamiliar with those, maybe check out the first video in this series and then return back to this one. I've made this sensory percussion file available via my Patreon. It makes it super easy to follow along with this tutorial with the same exact setup and sounds. You should be able to glean from this with or without those files, but I wanted to make that available to those of you that are interested. I have a series planned for sensory percussion tutorials like this, and we'll be making files available for all of them on Patreon. If you are following along with the files, make sure you have sensors on a kick plugged into drum 1 and a snare in drum 2. If you only have one sensor, you'll still be able to follow along with most of the examples. This video is split up into three sections. I included the time markers in the description of this video if you're interested in one part more than others. This window takes your velocity input and hones in how that velocity outputs to the rest of sensory percussion. As we hit the drum with different dynamics, we can see how the software is reading it. If you want the maximum velocity range out of your playing, you'll want to adjust this to make sure the softest you would actually play hits close to the bottom and your loudest hits close to the top. So now the software will output maximum dynamics from my actual playing range. If you want to rein that in a little, which is totally valid, you can leave this as a straight line or go for one of these presets. You can further fine tune settings pertaining to velocity in specific applications, so I wouldn't suggest doing anything too extreme with this window. So the resulting velocity from here is what outputs to our velocity controllers and samplers. Let's take a look at the sampler's velocity curve. This looks similar to the window we were just looking at. One huge difference is that we can cut out low or high values. For instance, in this case, the sampler will not respond to low velocity notes. Oftentimes, I want certain samples to have very little dynamic range. To do that, I can push this up, which means that even low velocity is going to translate to nearly full volume playback. It's not a good idea to totally max out the velocity here. If the drum accidentally gets triggered, it will for sure play back at full volume. So if you want virtually static playback volume, consider pulling this over so that ultra low velocity is ignored, so you have a little safety buffer. It's still going to result in nearly full playback volume with the upper half of your velocities, and you'll have some very subtle dynamic variation, which is gonna be just fine. We can do something less drastic, which would be making the velocity lean just a bit on the louder side, which would look like this or lean on the quieter side, which would look like this. These three things, nearly static volume, the slightly louder curve, and the slightly quieter curve, are what I find myself doing most all of the time with this window. You can also do some more creative things with this window. Let's totally invert this, so softer velocities result in louder playback, and louder velocities are quieter. I'm not sure there's any reason to do this other than to trip out your brain, but it's good to know that you have the tools to do this if you ever find the need to. One of my favorite uses for velocity controllers is modulating pitch of a snare sound. A default instance of the controller is going to modulate the pitch up as I play harder, but I actually like to go the other way. This way, my big backbeat is always the lowest pitch and my soft ghost strokes are higher and less imposing. Let's use velocity to modulate pitch of a melodic sound. Using quantize is probably going to be desirable. Try experimenting with smoothing for some really unnatural vibe sounds. Super cool nonetheless. Let's bring in a timbre controller to take this to the next level. I set up this timbre controller to modulate sample start time with center to edge. So as I move towards the edge, I'm cutting off the transient of the vibraphone sample making it way mellow. Try playing low and high pitches on the edge 
and compare that to low and high pitches in the center. With this setup, you have access to all of those extremes and everything in the middle. I like this setup because playing louder to get those higher pitches feels very natural. We are giving up our dynamics via velocity with these settings, but we can compensate for that in a really interesting way with this timbral modulation. Because we're using velocity to modulate pitch, we can split up our velocities to different samplers. This top sampler is only accepting velocities of 47 and up. The bottom is receiving only up to 46. By using different samplers, we can utilize different quantization settings and different smoothing settings. With this setup, we can have some nice portamento on our mid to high range, but none on our bass notes. Have a nice little jam with this and see what you think. We can use a velocity controller to enhance the perceived volume by modulating the drive parameter on the tube emulation effect. Note that the velocity curve is keeping velocity to volume control intact, but by simply adding a bit of drive to the louder notes, we're enhancing that. Like a good guitar amp that breaks up when you dig in a little bit. In the spirit of enhancing perceived volume, we could use velocity to bring in a second sampler with an octave lower sample. I'm achieving this just with the velocity curve window on the second sampler here. I'm not even using a velocity controller. Try turning on this timbre controller. We can now modulate the pitch of both samplers, adding an octave down with louder notes. In the last tutorial, we used center to edge for sample select to select different width claps. We can do the same thing with velocity, perhaps more intuitively. Softer for tighter claps, wider claps as we play harder. This frees up center to edge to modulate something else. How about a reverb send? Let's try using velocity on our snare to control sample select on a different drum. On the kick, I have a few different samples getting successively more aggressive. We're gonna use velocity from our snare to select which one the kick plays. Note the color coding on this box. This color corresponds to what drum the modulation is coming from. This is helpful when cross-modulating between drums to keep things clear. By controlling which sample the kick plays with the velocity on my snare, I'm preserving full dynamic control coming from my kick, and it can be applied to any of these samples. I could also use this velocity from the kick to control something else. Enable this guy to use velocity on the kick to modulate filter cutoff. In this last section of the video, I want to show a few examples of how you can utilize velocity controllers for utility purposes within the software. What do I mean by utility? I mean turning stuff on and off, toggling values. In the software, this is referred to as button control. Check out this example. We're using velocity from the rim to toggle which sampler receives triggers. The way this velocity controller is set up, it will accept virtually any hit of the rim and toggle the samplers. It's probably in your best interest to push up the threshold a tiny bit here to avoid accidentally triggering, but I like to keep it kind of close so I don't have to think about hitting the rim in a certain velocity in order for the modulation to occur. Contrast this with a subtle variation, toggling the power icons on the samplers instead of the stop receiving triggers icon. This has slightly different results, cutting off the sound of the old sampler immediately instead of just cutting it off from receiving new information. Note that I blended the rim tip with the center zone, so upon switching samplers you are also triggering the first note. A similar effect could be achieved with choke groups, but it's worth checking this out so you know your options. In this example, I have an effects chain on the head of this drum. All of the effects are off but they can be turned on by hitting the rim. This is an easy way to change a sound dramatically 
but be able to bring it back to the original as quickly as you can play. Note that I have a sound on the rim, just so the resulting sound of the part I'm playing makes sense. I find myself using zones that I wouldn't hit very often for these utility button purposes, but it feels weird for there to not be a sound when you hit a drum, so it's worth putting something in there, even if it's nondescript. We don't have to use a separate zone for utility purposes. Here we're toggling the panning hard left to hard right every time we hit the drum. Because we have a little bit of smoothing thrown into the mix, we can sort of catch the panning in the middle with buzzes because it doesn't have time to reach its destination. When you're looking for toggle style control with a continuous parameter, you can just click this icon for button control, select toggle, and make further adjustments. In this final example, we can use two drums to toggle the legato setting on the snare sampler. Kick is going to turn the legato off and snare is going to turn legato on. You can set this up by having each velocity controller send only one value, zero or one, low or high, on or off. We're having the snare send one, which turns legato on. The kick sends zero, turning legato off. The result is overlapping notes when playing the snare, but the LFO that's modulating the vibraphone sample is unveiled when turning legato off. I leave you with this very peaceful setup to jam on. See you next time.